Is Dr. Warp on it? Selling chronic or is he on it? Good God, no, he's just sharing his good ways. Greetings and blessings. I am Dr. Warp on it. MM, which stands for Medicine Man. I am full blooded Kiowa, full blooded Apache, full blooded Comanche, which means I'm 300% rugged. Yeah. And I'm from Oklahoma. So that means I got good ways, good ways. Yeah. Today I come to you from my sweat lodge. I call it my sweat lodge because the dryer always gets it hot and humid in here. And I get all sweaty all the time. But my laundry detergent makes it smell like summer breeze in here. So it balances all out just like creator intended. Oh, but this is where I make my medicine. And here are some of my doctor's tools. You'll notice I have a rock here. Because if all else fails, yeah, old ways. But this is my sweat lodge. Well, what we have here is all the ingredients for my famous lucky flavored ramen noodles. Yeah. I've decided to share all my recipes for my best medicine. I want to make sure I pass on my good ways. Yeah. This is my most popular medicine because it helps people win at casinos or win their money back when free play is no longer an option. Hey, I better quit it. Now, let's get started. First, you will need some water, but not just any water. It has to be bath water and your bath water after you soaked in it for about 30 minutes. <laughs> no joke, because this medicine has to be tied to you and only you somehow. And this is the best way. It's better than using your blood. I recommend taking a bath first thing in the morning before you get all greasy or your toe jams fill up or your bugs in your hair all wake up. Yeah. I'm no good. Nothing but trouble, my wife says. <laughs> Next, you will just add the ramen noodles into the jar of water. Do not mix in the flavor packet. Save that. Maybe I'll teach you how to make chicken flavored Kool-Aid in another episode. Hoo-wee. Next. We secure the contents of the jar and send it to the FBI for DNA analysis so they can run you through CODIS. Hey, no, we take it outside next. Now that we are outside, we let it cook naturally using the power of the sun, kind of like sun tea. Takes a few hours, but... I got some good stories about this medicine to share with you. Good ones. One time my niece won $10,000 playing one of those scratch and sniff cards you buy at gas stations right after she ate a bowl of this medicine. She said she got three sevens in a row instead of cherries. I had to ask her what those sevens smelled like since it was one of those scratch and sniff thingies. She said it smelled like money, I said. I hope it didn't smell like my money. I keep my money in my moccasins. Yeah, I got good ways, but I got bad ways too. Speaking of mocks, check out my socks. I have the tiger. Oh, it's my spirit animal. A lot of people ask me, how can a tiger be your spirit animal? Because there were no tigers around here. I tell them, I'm a medicine man. It can be whatever, Bigfoot, Predator, whatever I want. Yeah, I just need to leave me alone sometimes. Being a doctor, there's no room for errors. So I'm always practicing. This could be you right here. He even kind of looks like you. Hey, but he's better looking though. Yeah. So anyways, 
One time this guy ate a bowl of this medicine and went to the casino and he jackpotted two times in a row. He said it was more like three times in a row because he met his wife that night too. She was a white woman, fresh out of rehab. He kept her clean and even took her to Sundance with them where they gave her the Indian name. She walks in 12 steps. Ugh. It's ironic because his Indian name was Two Step, which I gave him because he liked white women so much. He was always going to those cowboy clubs and doing that Two Step dance with them. I guess the Indian name of their firstborn is going to have to be 14 Steps. It's not walking, but speaking of walking, I have to go inside and post some tweets. Y'all should add me. My Indian Twitter name is at I am the real medicine he man. Ah, joke. It's at Dr. Warbonnet. Had me. Now we are at the last step with the most important ingredients. You will need some sage and some sweet grass, but not just any sage or sweet grass. We better take this back outside. Mmm, you ever see a ramen packet like that? So since this medicine is being used to steal from the casino spirits, the last ingredients have to be stolen from someone. Not given or bought, but stolen. It's tricky with the little fine print of maybe losing your soul or soul or someone you love, but hey, it's gambling, right? So anyways, I steal mine from my wife. She keeps a lot of it. She likes to smudge me in my sleep to keep the snoring spirits away. Yeah. And she has to smudge the bathroom when I get back from the Chinese buffet to get rid of those bubblegut spirits, the BGs. Hey. She's got good ways, though, my wife, my queen. Witcha. Creator blessed me good. Now we must bless it in all four ramen directions. The beef way, the pork way, and the not so good seafood way, and the sacred chicken way. Oh, my favorite. Oh, creator. Last, you just pour some in a bowl. I'm using one of my good bowls here. And there you have it my famous lucky flavored ramen noodles. Eat a bowl before you go out gambling and don't let anyone else have any and you'll have good luck until we cross paths again. Haul. Oh. Lucky flavored ramen noodles may not be for everyone. In tests, some users have experienced symptoms such as delusions of grandeur, constant itchy palms, sore spin button fingers, dilated bonus size, rig machine rage, ashtray aroma, free soda diabetes, pawn shop syndrome, loss of good ways, and return of old ways. <laughs> hey, welcome back. Welcome to... Red Hoop Talk. I'm Shannon O'Loughlin. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma coming to you live from the lands of the Piscataway people. And welcome everyone, <laughs> uh, aka Dr. Warbonnet, that native Thomas, otherwise known as Thomas Yepa. Welcome, Thomas, to the show. Uh, take your mute button off there. We, we, we need to hear you. Welcome. Where are you coming from? From Bedford, Oregon, uh, land of the Cow Creek Band of Uncle Indians. Uh, I can't remember the other tribes right now, but um, it's kind of debatable, this land right that I'm on, between these tribes. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you have something against the Oregon tribes? No, I think the three of them claim this city area, this this valley. That's but um, right. you have a little... That little um, phone number search that they have, it has the Cow Creek Umqua, but other tribes around here would debate that, from and, my understanding. And, and Thomas, you're a uh, Kiowa. And Kiowa, Apache, and, and Comanche. 
and Comanche. Holy it's hell. The of Cheyenne. Oh, hell. So um, what kind of man does that make you? It's a wild Indian from the plains. <laughs> <laughs> so did you grow up in uh, in Oklahoma or where do you come from? Yeah, I grew up in um, Anadarko, Oklahoma. Probably one of the most worst town, most, most rugged towns in Oklahoma. But it's, you know, as bad as things are there, you know, it's just really good. The family, how you know everybody, everybody knows each other and takes care of each other, you know. You know, one thing I was thinking about, you know, a thing about here is homelessness is a big problem here. You're never going to find it in Anadarko, no matter how, no matter what people say about it, how bad it is. You're never going to find that. Yeah. We all, well, take, all take care of each other down there, just like most Native, Native American communities. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it was interesting hearing you, you know, say my name. I'm, I'm gathering more names, I guess. All these Indian, and there's going to be more too. Well, so it's, like, it's going to be hard to find my work because I'm going to be going under all these different names. Well, and you've done a lot. So, I mean, you're not just a filmmaker. You're not just a comedian. You're also an author. You write children's books. You write um, all sorts of genres of, of books. And you're, you've been playing around with a lot of different uh, film and, and different film genres, all focused on um, Native American. What do you think brings all of it together for you? And then I want to go backwards to like um, a little more about you, but you've got such a broad um, repertoire of work that you've been doing. What ties it all together? It's a very good question. You know, the base, um, one of the things is on one of my background, I know everyone knows, but I've been in Hollywood. I worked in Hollywood for uh, a little over a year uh, with ABC Disney Studios. They were shopping me around or teaching me how to be a TV writer. And they were going to staff me and give me agents and all that. And I turned it all down. You know, and a lot of people don't know I left Hollywood. And one that's one of the reasons why is, is uh, because you have to stick to a certain genre, certain style of writing. I didn't want to do it. And, you know, I didn't, it wasn't what I got into the business for. And after a while I realized, you know, Hollywood was changing me and um, that I was going to start chasing the money and, you know, and that title doing something that I didn't really, really want to do that. I was just doing it for the notoriety and, you know, the, whatever comes with it, you know, especially then, cause there was, there's only like a handful of native writers that could even write for TV. There's actually a lot more now, even though there's not a lot now, there was a lot more than when I was there. Right. You know, we all knew each other, like four or five of us. And, um, but yeah, in other circumstances too, I had to choose, I had to choose between my career and my family. And if I wanted to be a father, I chose being a father and I left and just wasn't happy with it. But that's one of the things I would always hear is like, you can't write all these genres, you know, you can't write horror, comedy, you know, one hour dramas. Cause I would submit pilots to them. They would help me write pilots and um, spec scripts for different television shows. You know, and I found myself, you know, on sets of shows like Hannah Montana and places I never thought, you know, you would see someone like me at, you know, and um, it just wasn't my thing. And I'd always, you know, I was a good joke writer. I didn't notice that. They would, you know, ask me for, you know, what do you think is a good joke, you know, and I'd throw in something and write on the fly, you know, I could do it. And, um, that's, you know, that's one of my strengths. But I also could tell a really good trauma, uh, trauma or drama of um, story as well. And uh, it was on drama sets as well. But even now, you know, you say that, you know, with this whole Don Dr. Warbonnet thing, it's an experiment. It's just me wanting to experiment something with, you know, like, all right, people need something fast and quick. People, you know, people are actually getting them hard to sit through whole stand up routine. So let me just do these little tidbits and these little recipes and something funny. Because originally it was just going to be like a recipe show. I was just going to make medicine. But then I thought, um, now it's going to make funny medicine, you know, that, and, uh, that, you know, natives would find humorous. And, um, it was just going to be just kind of that thing. But then I thought, well, maybe I just throw a little joke, like a little stand up at the end. Cause I, cause I was watching a show called peep show and they do a POV. And I, you know, I, that's one of the things right. even as writers and author, I wrote a, I wrote one of my first novels that never got published. And that's another thing. I do a lot of writing that I know never see the light of day, but it was done in POV or first person. And he's like, you can't do that. And, um, because I know you can't do that in film as well. And I saw a television show. I wanted to try it. I was like, I'm going to try this. And that's where the whole making recipes came came about. And then I just, well, I want to make it funny. So if people want to watch it, they can laugh a little. And then, but then I was thinking, well, maybe I should show Dr. Warb on his face. And um, that's where those stand-up come in. So, um, and it's supposed to just be like a minute, but um, 
I stand up at the end of that one's like almost five minutes, and the other episode's about five minutes. And the next episode about the release is about five minutes of stand up. And all in all, that so they're all episodes are supposed to only be like three minutes long, two minutes long. And I have a problem of, you know, being really doing short stuff. It's hard for me to do something short and, you know, to write even a simple story. That's one of the hardest things to do. But I'm learning, you know, and I don't know what what it's going to be used for. I always, you know, I, I think I'm on the path, not my path, but, you know, to get the path creator, God, whatever, whatever people call him, want to call him, um, set me on. So I'm being prepared for something. For some reason, I have to tell short stories and short, short stand up. And um, it's very interesting because that's the time we live in. People's yeah. attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. So, Don't you know it? Yeah. And th so this is this is Dr. Warbonnet right here. I've, I've got it up on the screen. And if you go to uh, Thomas's Facebook page for Dr. Warbonnet, uh, you can catch his uh, his short comedy routines here. Um, and uh, ooh, happy egg hunting day. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 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 there you are. So, um, what made you uh, think of Dr. Warbonnet and 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 the uh, and wearing the Warbonnet because that's so controversial? Um, yeah, that it's people really, use that really outside of right. Yeah, and I'm waiting for someone to question me. You know, <laughs> there's going to be great. They got we, you know, natives. You can't make everyone happy. So I'm waiting for that person, you know, to gripe because you know it's like if I Native Americans can't wear, who can wear and blah blah. And then you could you go different um, cases with it and everything. But with that one, it's just um, it more or less had to do with the name because it's, it's not going to be the first character I do. It's going because I'm going to try to introduce a Milton character I'm working on, which I think I'm going to try to name him Johnny Mohawk. And, uh, you know, I got the Mohawk going on and he's going to be a militant John Trudell type character and doing poetry, militant poetry, but with mm -hmm. some humor to it uh, and some other stuff. Um, I'm, I'm actually really developing him. And then I want to do a long hair native one, you know, and um, his probably a long hair is going to have some being a name as well. And, and it's just just being, you know, humorous that we can't laugh at ourselves. You know, we ain't got no business laughing at anybody else type thing. <laughs> And you know, I, I've been around the different people. I've I've experienced these still these um I won't call them stereotypes, but archetypes of people of natives. They're all out there, you know. Every I mean, everyone native knows someone that talks like Doctor Bourbon. You know, old guy comes around talking like that, and we and most natives I know can do that voice as well. It's not <laughs> a voice I made up. It's something I hear around people joking around about. You know, and it's it's kind of a voice that people can joke you know, when they're trying to be like. You know, a medicine man type of person, and make a joke about it, and and so I've used it. You know, so it's not original. It's just something I grew up hearing, and you know, being around people I've been around, and same with this other characters I have going on. I've been around. Everyone knows the the angry Indian, the real militant Indian that just takes it a little bit too far. So you know, I want to I want to do that as well, and just bring you know joy to. I mean, this the subjects are serious out there, but there does have to be humor out there, and we have we have to laugh as long as we. Have, you know, we can be serious and be protesting. I'm all for the protests and all for the, you know, medicines and and all for what I'm developing. There's other characters as well. And, and just bring some um, some kind of, you know, I guess imagery to it too as well. Because I think it really imagery is going to be really good too. Because I could do the same jokes, just dressed up like me and plain Jane or plain Joe outfits and everything. But I don't think it'll make the kind of impact that I want to kind of create in the and the, um, it'd be easy for people to just skip by it, you know? But then right. they see stuff like that, and they're like, hey, it's this guy talking about. Who's this guy? But um, I'm waiting for you to do a, a, a and now I'm going to get killed for this one. I'm waiting for you to do a big Apache woman. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be interesting. It'd be yes. interesting. And, and so, I ain't ever tried it because I, I, my roots are in acting. I, all this started with me being in theater. Right. And um, yeah, so I, I'm, my, my roots are in acting and it's really, it feels very good going back to it because this is a character, it's not me. 
You know, well, so when I'm sitting there doing these stand up you're seeing, yeah, I'm not doing it as me. I'm in character. I'm totally so whatever points points of view that character has, I create it. But when I'm in that character, I'm not in my points of view. And so, you know, was was theater the first thing you got into? I mean, was uh, like like where does your career start? Uh, did you go to school? No, it's all self-taught. It's yeah. All self-taught. Um, writing. I guess it would say it started in theater. And I got the notion I had written a story about a bridge. Oh, it's kind of a horror story, and people liked it at half school and Asian University. So I was already probably about 23 when I journeyed on this venture, 23, 24. And um, everyone liked the story, so I passed it around. I made copies of it. And uh, at the time, I took theater because I didn't want to take another class. So I just happened upon it. It was actually wasn't even a really something I was going for. And something I didn't think I could do either because I was kind of shy. And um, didn't think I would be able to do it. Well, I wouldn't say I was shy, but as far as I was kind of a cool guy, you know, I was, you know, my house was the party house in high school. And, and you know, I've always been going around a cool crowd, you know, I played football in high schools, did all that kind of junk. And, but uh, yeah, so theater and arts and all that was kind of not my thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I got into theater and acting classes, I really liked it. My teacher, Pat Melody, really felt I had a knack for it and encouraged me and I started seeing how plays were written and I was like, wow, these are, you know, and um, my big inspiration was I was looking for, I had to do a, I had to do a sh- scene out of a short play. So she sent me to the library and, uh, or told me to go to the library. And I happened to go to the public library instead of the university library, look for a play, a scene from a play to, to act out. And I ran into a book by Hane Gigamal, which Gigamal is a Kiowa name and um, from Anadarko, from where I'm from. And I was like, whoa, what's this doing here in Lawrence, Kansas Library? And I picked it up and there is a story called 49, which is just about this guy who passed out and everybody's rolling him, taking everything he has. And he's really dead. And no one cares enough to check on that. And um really touched me. It really inspired me. Like, wow, someone told a real story that, you know, I know that that's probably happened many a times in Anadarko. Yeah. And he's got it here in book form and inspired me. He's like, wow, maybe I could write with this guy, get a story like that published. I got hundreds of those kinds of stories. So maybe I could do as well. So I started writing short plays and uh, luckily I knew the people around me and um, they had uh, acted out some of them with me and um, we did some of them. And then I start writing more short stories and I had a little collection, a little binder. I passed it around to people that wanted to read them which ultimately became my first book. Um, and a guy had a, a guy that worked at the Plaza Center where we all plaza that. Everybody knows the whole plaza and stuff, but uh, he had caught hold of it. He was a native guy and he wanted, he was an aspiring director and um, he liked the story in there. And he said, hey, can I make this story of yours into a short film? At the time, I didn't know anything about short films. I was like, no. Or I was like, yeah, but, um, I don't think this make a good short film. I was like, how about I write you a short film? And um, I'd never written even saw a script before or know how to write a script, but that's how my mind works. It's like, I got an idea and I think I can do it. Mm-hmm. But I went and read magazines and stuff like that to learn how to do it and um, wrote a short film called Bros. And he it was really good. I really wish I finished it. I actually tried to shoot it three times myself, but um, just circumstances kept making it fall through. But he, can we cat on because I have that's in direct direct or I was in the theater, so I had the actors involved that he needed. He had the camera, he was learning how to edit it, he was showing me how to edit. And we're all excited about it. And then but then he had to move and right before he finished it. And um uh, then all the actors and actresses said, hey, hey, you were basically doing all the directing anyways. The only thing you lack was the camera. Hmm. And so they inspired me to do it. And I didn't know that Haskell had a TV station and a whole TV studio in the library. I didn't even know it. And I'd been there like four years already. And so I went back there and asked uh, Bill Curtis, the, the professor at the time, if I could use his cameras and everything to make a short film. And he, he you know, I wasn't in the class. And I don't even think at the time I was enrolled in Haskell. I think I was taking a semester off. But I, he agreed as long as I took some of his TV students with him. And I was like, that's even better because I don't know how to operate a camera or lighting or anything. And so we sat out and 
it fell through, but we were, uh, we, but I just like, you know what? I'm going to write another story. So I wrote another story called hate equals hate about uh, these Indians that go out and kill a white guy every Columbus day. <laughs> but then one of the white guys ends up falling with a white woman off in college and comes back and has a hide that fact from his friends. But then they find out and they turn on him and it was like a reverse racism and it's very harsh, very explicit. Mm. And, um, we shot it and I submitted the film. Some people saw it, so you should submit the film festivals. I didn't know what that was about. So I'm like basically doing it, not knowing anything. Like, what's a film festival? You know, even though I shot this short film. <laughs> so I had no, I was just going to show it to friends, you know, to hang out at parties. And, yeah. and then, you know, that's what we would do too. We'd all party and watch it because it was real rowdy. And against, you know, that particular subject matter would get people riled up, you know, especially natives who were near, you know, mm-hmm. having fun. But, uh, and, and, it, and I put on VCR tapes and I hear even to this day, people like, hey man, it's that party I saw. That hate equals hate on VCR tape. This guy had it and has a VCR just to play your tape during parties. I was like, wow, it's, it's, it's still got the spirit going. It gets people <laughs> rounded. Yeah. But yeah, it, it went over the film festival circuit and, and it got screened and that it got all the way to San Francisco American Indian Film Festival, which is when I, you know, I went and I actually got to fly out there and go attend this screening and they paired it up with U2. U2 had a v- music video out with the Native American theme that they produced. I don't know if it ever got shown on MTV, but they did it this wow. past year film festivals and mine screened right after it at this theater. And um, and at the time I was like, why would it, you know, at the time I was excited because I was like, oh yeah, you too. You know, I was going to have their video screening, premiering, and then mine's going to be right after. And man, it was, it just shocked everybody. And I noticed that about it. People would walk out within the first Ooh. minute of the film because it wow. was so shocking. Because it opens up with them killing this white dude, calling him Columbus, knowing that it's Columbus Day, and taking out all their anger at him. And um, and I don't and I don't hold it back. I did it in one take. And um, I was exploring with filmmaking techniques. I didn't know how to do film. I did that scene on one take. I did other scenes improv, and I did other scenes written. But yeah, it got a lot of a lot of talk. A lot of people liked it. And it, it, it went around. And um. That's one of the things I really liked about it was it's you either liked it or you hated it. And um, it's it's on YouTube somewhere. So you can find it on one of my oh, accounts that got locked that locked me out. But um <laughs> Yeah, but from there, you know, I realized I could be a screenwriter. Wow. And at that time I was um uh, then I really started ramping up my filmmaking, teaching myself how to make films by making films. So I didn't sit down and watch T V shows, I didn't go look at take no class. And so it came to the time where I made so much films that, you know, I was using cameras, the equipment so much I asked for the TV professor said, hey, Thomas, you got to take a TV production class because I'm not going to justify you using all the equipment all the time, you know. And I wasn't getting in their way. I would just know when they weren't using it, you know, even if it was at two o'clock in the morning, you know, and I would even they would even allow me late access in there. And I would even stay in there all night editing and to their library. And I got really obsessed and learning and t- teaching myself and, um, had to take a class finally so that's the only learning i really had but even in a class you just said just pick a project and you know take some people with you we were all learning and it was pretty you know i had a whole team behind me and and eventually it led to um abc and disney having this uh summer workshop in santa fe and they were only choosing so many people natives to go and I got chosen. I went in the second year. I got chosen the first year, but I couldn't take the time off because of my family. And uh, second year, I could. And I went out and just competed with 18 other Native filmmakers, good ones, and um, for a contract to work for them for, for in, uh, in Hollywood. And at the time, I thought I was going for a directing fellowship, but I found out when I got out there, I was a TV. I was going to be a TV writer, and I, was, and I knew nothing about TV writing. But they taught me, and it was really good learning experience, but um, well, pretty interesting because, well, you know, I got out there thinking I was, you know, the big wig, you know? Yeah. You know. Well, well, let's let's stop for a second and break all of this down because you have had a lot going on for a long time and I want to kind of go, go, go back a little bit and, and you went to uh, Sherman Indian uh, Indian school. No Riverside, Riverside, it's Riverside. It's an um, they get confused because of the Riverside thing. Right, right, it's right. It's the same time. It's the same thing. A lot of people who go to Sherman actually go to Riverside too. So, so you went to Riverside, and um, uh, so is that where you started getting into theater, or was it after that? 
after that at Haskell. At Haskell. All right. All right. Riverside, so- I, was, I was just wild. I was um, not a good guy. I graduated. Why barely. weren't you a good guy? Why weren't you a good guy? What was going on? I was just upbringing where I was at, you know, just doing, you know, dirt, I guess they call it now, doing a lot of dirt and getting away with it. You know, in the yeah. long run, you know, be truthful. I only went, to, I only finished school because uh, that's where I sold a lot of my drugs. And that's, yeah. you know, that kind of supported me. And, um, yeah, like I just said, I played football there. All my friends were there. And at the time, Riverside was not a place to go. You know, mm. it was, it was pretty, it was pretty, it was pretty rough. Not like it is now. Now it's really a good place to go. And, and, um, why, why, it, it why, was it like, why was it like that back then? And why has it changed? I don't know. I would say, you know, a lot of old thinking and old ways of doing. Um, Cause I'm working on a, I'm working on a, a long standup routine, you know? And uh, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm talking about in there is like uh, my first year there, they brought us, you know, they would bring us all in the gym and have a little square tape down in the center of the gym and had boxing gloves there. And anybody who had grudges against anybody could pick who they had grudges wins. They had to fight in the middle. And everybody watched it and see who won. And, you know, and I have a, you know, I'm working on stand up where this guy called me out. I thought we were friends. And um, I guess I did something to him to make him mad. And we went out and boxed and I lost my temper. And I ended up chasing him out of the, out of the gym and beating him down really bad outside. But, um, but it was really harsh like that. And that's how it was, you know, wow. like the kids went there too. So if the kids messed up, we were the parents. That, that the matrons or teachers would tell us, hey, this kid's acting up, bullying these kids. So we would go and take that kid, teach him a lesson. You know, don't, you know, that you want to you want to bully. This is what we're going to be bullying you every time we hear you bullying. And that bullying would stop, you know, and it's, so it's really, it was really bad, you know, people getting beat up. We all just talking to a guy the other night and he's talking about, you know, blanket parties like on Full Metal Jacket where you get tied up and beat up with bars of soap and pillowcases. That would happen. A lot of stuff would happen out there. And, but it was good in a way. I was exposed to a lot of different tribes because people from Florida were there, New York, Washington, here in Oregon. I had friends here in Oregon that went to Riverside, um, California, everywhere. And I learned about everyone else's culture, everyone's stories, which I bring into my storytelling now because of nights of us just sitting there telling each other stories and stuff like that. And, and, they, and a lot of our classes would teach stuff about um, stuff you wouldn't find in normal classrooms, like little people. I remember we spent a lot of time talking about that in some of our classes and medicine and sage and sweats. We had sweats, um, the Native American church, all of it, you know. Wow. Uh, and, you know, it was, so it was really, it was almost anti-assimilation um, because I went in there, an urban Indian, and I learned a lot of about my culture during during that time, but I was still going to powers all my life. And I live right down the street from Apache tribe, Oklahoma's headquarters, like not even a block away. So I always walked down there. They had that, they'd have powers every weekend. So hmm. and then I'd go to powers at different places as well. And, but I've grown up all around that culture, my culture and people and places and, you know, everything that I tell in stories, I think I feel, I can talk with about you know other cultures and other tribes just because I've been around a lot of those people and I'm exposed to different the way they do things and the way we do things and this and that. So how was appreciation for it? How how was Haskell uh, different than than Riverside? Haskell, I got to turn my you know my whole persona around. I got to be you know like most people go to college, you get to be someone new, and I got to be someone positive. And and I didn't really it was, it was an open experience because. I wasn't, I didn't expect myself to live past 21. I accepted it. And um, when I hit 21, that's when I went to Haskell because I was like, oh, I got to do something in my life now. Because I was living recklessly, doing crazy stuff. And um, didn't have no dreams. I didn't have no ambitions, you know. And um, college was just something my mom wanted me to do really bad. And um, I always thought I always wanted to please her sometime. And plus, other circumstances, the law was after me in Oklahoma, so I had to jump state, and it all worked out. And I went and hit out in college, and uh, basically I was hiding out. And then hiding out, I um, 
got open to new worlds, you know, people, Indians with goals and stuff like that. You know, I had friends that had goals of being <laughs> Indians with goals. <laughs> yeah. sounds, sounds like a hashtag or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, like, so, so was it the, the fear and um, that really kind of turns you around or um, were there, there are people or um, anything that happened that kind of pulled you out of that life besides just school? Uh, just knowing that I wasn't, I always knew kind of I was, in a, I was kind of a fish, big fish in a little pond. That I didn't really, that I had bigger, had abilities in me that I could do stuff. I didn't know what they were because originally I was, I went to school to be, um, I went from accountant to social work to political science Woo. and then to uh, business management. So I switched majors like all within my time there. There's so many different ways I wanted to do. And then I wasn't even really that concentrated on business management because if you my transcripts start getting all these acting classes and and eventually I start write, I start taking creative writing and more arts than there were business. Even my advisor like you got to do something about this. You know you only got one business class, and but I in my head I knew I was destined to do something else. But um, they had no um, bachelors in it, so I would just using the business management to stay in there longer. Right, right. Take more classes. And right. yeah, so I wouldn't say anything inspired me. I just, just my path in life is where I was led right. to and through a lot of deaths as well. Yeah. Um, Two of my yeah. friends died at high school. That's really where I started to become a writer. That the night they died, the night they died, both of them died. I had picked up a pen and wrote a poem and I never stopped writing since then damn yeah you were telling me that you write every night yeah like people brush their teeth before they go to sleep i write something yeah it tells me a story about um also my path as a writer in high school i took a native american literature course at my high school the first year it was ever introduced even though our high you know our public school in my hometown is probably at least 70 percent 60% Native American and when you know we never had this course offered and we did and um it was filled up and I think they were gonna kick me out or something if I didn't take another course but everything's filled up. But this teacher of his Native American literature class, even though she's filled up, she let me in. And I loved, you know, and she knew like how she knew I was kind of a bad guy. And um that's before I went to Riverside. I was still in the public school and uh it was really good. Everybody went into it because we had a different Native American dish every Friday, like Indian tacos or meat pies mm -hmm. or Indian corn. So everybody wanted in there just to eat, you know. <laughs> of course. But I got introduced to these books. Even to this day, I don't remember the names of them, but they were really harsh, really explicit type of books. And um, that's kind of where my writing style is. And the irony of that whole story, though, is I really excelled and it really interested me. I was actually one of the classes I really went to because I'd skipped a lot of classes too. You know, like I said, I wasn't, the, I wasn't a model citizen or model student. Mm -hmm. But my best friend, I got his per cap, his Indian money, and we were partying around together. And um, he would pick me up. And there's another story I have involved with that. But in the long run, one night, he, I didn't go with him. And he had went back to his home where he was staying like 20 miles away in a different city. And he had fell asleep at the wheel and hit a car hit on. And it was my Native American literature teacher. Oh, God. Her. And she was coming from a Mothers Against Drunk Driving meeting where she was um, one of the ones that ran it. And because her daughter had died in a drunk driving accident. And um, so she died and we didn't have Native American. We had, well, it was kind of just a. a they didn't really pick it back up until after I left, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, everyone, we just wonder what to do now. And it was a really sad time. And I felt really bad about that. And I was like, wow, I was like, I could have been in that truck with my friend, you know, and died and died with my Native American. And, you know, it's sad that my Native American literature, the first one exposed me to it. My best friend killed in a drunk driving accident, you um, know. But uh, that's that's a hood. But that's kind of one of the paths that took me here, too, as well. I mean, I could. And there's a lot of stories like that with my path to be a writer and a storyteller. That's why I know I'm not ever going to give up. I ain't there yet. I ain't 
I ain't made it there yet. And then, you know, when I first started out, I always said, I'm, I don't know. I don't care if I'm making the world as a writer, but as long as I inspire the person that does, I'm going to be happy. That's, you know, what I, that's my goal. I'm going to sit down and write. Well, hey, let's talk about some of, some of your books. I'm going to, I'm going to pull up. Uh, where do I pull up? Oh, Amazon. Uh, Amazon seems to always be the place to pull things up at. So here are some of your books. And uh, I was happy to see these uh, uh, children's books too. The Underwear Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the underwear boy versus the witch war party. Number one. What are these about? Those are, I started out my own publishing company to publish the last powwow. And uh, that's when eBooks were coming out mm -hmm. first coming out and me and Steve, Paul Judd was talking about it. You know, we should go to the publishing company or not. Cause I was still kind of attached to the publishing company. I did my first book. And so I had to get out of that somehow. Cause I didn't like the, I didn't like how they handled my first book. Um, and I didn't like the idea that I didn't own the rights to it as well. Like right now, you know, I just got my book rights back to it recently. So I'm going to try to get it as an ebook, but it's oh, kind of weird yeah. not owning your, your um, book, your rights to your stories. You know, so if I wanted to shoot one of a, a part of it into a film, I couldn't do it. I had to go through a lot of legal stuff to do it. Wow. But even when I was with ABC and Disney, I had to sign a contract with them for the whole year I was with them any idea I came up with or anything I wrote on paper was theirs. And um, so I found that really weird. Like, wow, so I can't even come with the idea. Not why you're in contract with this. Wow. I can't write a story down. Nope, not why you're in contract with this. You have to write us everything you're writing right now so that if it comes out later, you can show us that you had it before you came with this. And so I had to write down everything I was writing on, wow. on all my projects I was doing before I went into that contract. But same with publishing, publishing you know, so. I decided to create my own publishing company and the first stepping stone was just children's books I had in my head and uh, just short stories, basically, but with story, but the, they're unique because I put in there when you're reading the story, I put in sound effects where the breeder can say the sound effect, you know, like, or boom, or, you know, like an arrow shooting. And so you read it and you can, and it has all the sound effects where you can throw sound effects in if you read it to a child. And without you having to come up with it yourself, because that's how I used to read stories to my children. Right. I do all the stories, and, you know, do all the sound effects and everything. And so I did it in that way as well. But I only reached as an ebook because I see I was wanting to see if I could create an ebook. And I learned, watched all videos, and learned how to do it. And um, I did it. And I did three of them. Wow. And uh, I originally put them on there for free, but Amazon won't let you give them away for free. And these other websites, they would allow, allow me to do them for free. So these other websites, which a lot of people have gone away from, though. But when ebooks first came out, they had other websites that people would go to. I can't remember the name of them right now, but there were several of them. Like Barnes and Nobles had one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Borders had one. Nook, Nook was one of them. Uh, a couple other places. But before it got all, you know, bombarded by Amazon, Amazon owns everything. Now, there were other places yeah. where I could give it away for free. And people were taking, were downloading it, but Amazon wouldn't. You know, now they took it over. They won't. They won't release it for free. But originally, it was always supposed to be free. Surprising thing though is it did way good in Asian countries, and giving away for free because I got to see you know who downloaded and everything, and they did get a lot of downloads in Asia, wow. Asian countries. And, and I learned that uh, that's how they learned the Eng English though, is through children's books. But that makes sense. That makes that's sense. That's where those come from. So, and I still hope you know. I don't think I'll ever print them, but um, I, I still every now and then ask Amazon to put them for free, and, they, and Amazon will. But they only do it for a little bit, like a week or two, and after a while, I just I was like, you know, it's not even worth it no more. Right. And I, f I actually forgot about it until you until you got this interview together, and I was you asked me for some links, and I was like, wait a minute, I got some children's book I never promote. But they're really good stories for native children, like That's I said. Cool. So, okay. so what about this ex Indian Chronicles? So, we were talking a little bit about that before the show. Um, uh, you can you talk a little bit about what it's about? Yeah, it's about four friends growing up in uh, Indian City, which is kind of like which is what they call Anadarko, uh, where I grew up. But I but it's mis 
it's like uh what do you call it mythological mythology fantasy type characters yeah. like their woman uh stuff like that grandma spider it's missing mixing those two worlds the realism and, and you know our, um mystical world together really harsh you know there's stories about um like my the one that wrote me the um abc disney contract that story is in there it's called my favorite runner about these guys that uh get this guy to buy on beer all the time and then these white guys are shooting him with baby bb guns he's a wino type guy and these indian guys that get on the run beer from all the time decide to back him up and turn the tables around on those white guys and um uh, that's what made you know that good impact on that story but it's there's funny stories, there's romantic stories, there's scary stories. The opening story is a scary story, but it's all tied together. These four characters, these, they're braves trying to become warriors mm. in a world where, you know, their identity, they don't know who they are, basically. that They're not Indians, they're not Native Americans, you know, they're not traditional, they're not, you know, they're urban, they're caught between worlds. And that's why I dubbed the name ex-Indians, which is a play on, you know, um, X like E X Indians, or it could be X as in um, Generation X. It could be mm -hmm. X as in Rated X, because you know there's a lot of a lot of um, raw stuff in there. Oh, yeah. Very raw. It's about the raw as you as I can say. And it was actually um, it's going. It's two. It was when I brought it to the publishing company. It was enough for three books, I think it was. Um, they chose the best stories, the best stories I could tie together. And the new book I'm writing is, is well, I can't give too much away about that first one, but um, <laughs> uh, but it's it, it's not a sequel. It's I'm, their brother and sister book, and they're going to be opposites of each other. It's going to be real cool. I think when I when I get a third book out, cover art's mm -hmm. done 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 by Bucky Bunky, Echo Hawk back in yeah. his early days. I asked him if we could really um uh, use this. Artwork and yeah, it's, that's why I really dig about that that cover. It really explains the modern with the, with the traditional and old, and it's really it got you know a lot of people use it in their classrooms and universities and high schools. You know, I get a lot of messages from people, especially younger children. You know, that one of the things I really like is people saying it's the best book they that you know youth has youth will message me and say it's the best book I ever read. Yeah. And the teachers will say, "My, this person don't read books, but I, I gave them your book, and they finished it from front to back real fast." Wow! I get that a lot of it because it's real. It's, I mean, yeah, I, I don't. It's not sugar. The post company didn't let me. Didn't sugar, sugarcoat any of it, or didn't make me sugarcoat any of it. And it's just as real as real can be. So, what about um? You want to talk about the last powwow? Yeah, the last powwow. Last powwow, which um also a brother book to that or a sister book to that is being in, is being written right now. It's not going to be a sequel. It's going to be a different side of it. But it originally came out. It's Stephen Paul Judd's idea or Mara's idea to begin with. Originally, he just wanted to do an anthology of writers telling stories or native writers knew and I was going I said I would do it if I if he allowed me to do the first story and the last story first chapter and last story and then we cursed when then we start tying together well let's make it about something let's they make every writer write about a certain subject and we say like, let's do it about powwows so, yeah they are like everyone's going to a power we all have a going to a power story or we can all create one and that's when I was like I'm gonna come up with this big idea this big power at the end where full bloods only full bloods are allowed there's going to be a big climatic scene. And Little Red Man was supposed to be the first story. It's not now. I think it's like fourth chapter. But um, I wanted a blind kid to get this medicine woman to the powwow and make it funny. And it was one of the hardest things to do in my life. And I actually sat on it for about six to eight months. And Steve kept saying, you start that first chapter yet? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't know how to make this funny. How do I make a blind boy taking his dick? grandmother to a powwow and you know i was trying to make it to where he at one point in the time he drove he had to drive and i came with the character johnny butt who smelled like butt cab driver you know and somehow i was gonna get his hands hurt or cut off so that he couldn't drive and little red man had to drive on his lap and that, that part never made it to the, 
to it, but uh, yeah, but that's originally where it was all, that's where it all came from. And after that, all the writers weren't, weren't um, up to the task, I guess you could say, or too busy or something happened where at the end, you know, I came with a revelation and all these chapters start coming out of my head. I mean, he started talking and he started having other chapters that he, stories he wanted to do, he's trying to choose from. And I was like, well, let's just do them all. Let's tie them all together somehow. And we start meeting every week, coming with new characters, and um, just bouncing ideas off each other. And there's a lot, a lot of characters that didn't make it into the last spell. Uh, a lot of stories that didn't. But uh, that was the final ones that we decided we would roll with. And we matched that. And, you know, like I said, the newer book will have some of the characters that we didn't get to include and new different perspectives of what the journey was there and what it was. And people want to know the background of it and we're still trying to get on tv steven's got a pilot script that he's you know shopping around i have pilot script i'm shopping around or i'm trying to get noticed and um we're getting closer and closer to it oh, it was okay. optioned by a hollywood producer for a while there but that luckily that i don't want to say luckily but that contract expired and now we own right our right our movie rights back to it and everything so we've got our movie rights and tv rights to back to it recently so now we're going to really try to pursue getting it on tv or wherever we can get it at so and it's a really good story i mean i don't know if you've read it but um it's in classrooms as well cool. and i think it's got a lot of it, because i self-published it it didn't get it didn't go where it could have went and uh because i have no i have no background in marketing and steven really doesn't either and um especially not books and we didn't know what to do with it. We just thought, Hey, we can do this and let's do it. You know? And I was like, I got a publishing company now, so I can, I can print it. I can put an ebook and we had some people sign us, you know, a year later to do the audio book for it. I did the narrating, but in the long run it suffered because we didn't go to the publishing company mm. and it was, it's worthy enough. And it does, it gets overlooked because it's people say it's self-published, but it's through, it's through my publishing company. And it kind of is, you know, and I would, you know, I've, I've reached out to people with these top 10 Indian Native American books you should read, and mine's never on the list, or tw even 20 books, you know, and all of them say it's just self published. And I'm like, well, this, you know, since we've, since we've released it in 2016, it hasn't been, it hasn't went a month without selling a lot of copies. It sells yeah. every month. And my, my wife has just come out of publishing company company world and she's like yeah books go they die down and then they never get never get sell a copy for months years at a time and, you know it's, it's amazing that yours keeps selling every month because i you know i because I, I published it i tracked the, the numbers of yeah so so what's your what's your uh writing process so if you were talking to, to some some kids what what would you tell them is has been your most important um thing that you do to help you write or to figure out what it is you want to say because you have went in so many different directions and used different kinds of you know whether it was writing a book a play a children's book comedy uh, horror i mean you've been in all of it like what is what is your process how do you get there what is it you're trying to do or say? That's interesting. Because, you know, I showed you last time we talked, I told you about that horror film I did. Yeah. And I just did that just to see if I could do it. Yeah. To see if I could scare people. That, that's what I, that's what I'm seeing from you is it's just like, how do you do that? All right, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that over there. And then how do you write it? How do you get it published? I don't know. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to, you know, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I think that's so cool because I've seen that with myself in my life. And, you know, I'm, you, we go down a path and sometimes, you know, we just have something driving, right? Driving you. Um, uh, but what is, now that you've been doing this for quite a while, you write every day. Uh, is, is that really the, the, the most important thing to you now is just that you're writing every day and that you're spending time on it? Or, 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 or what is it that you do to, to really focus you? 
Um, I would say the main focus is just to be just to prepare myself um, for some reason. I think storytellers and the Native American culture were a big part yeah. of our culture because especially wintertime telling stories, which, you know, my tribe has with the trickster, we call them same day. You know, we only told those during the winters because they were trapped in a teepee during the winter. So the, the storytellers part was really important because they entertain not only the adults, but the children to keep them yeah. still and busy enough, you know, to, to entertain. So we always had that ability to tell them stories, you know, with all of our creation stories, all of our, how this came to be, why do we do this? Why do we do that? You know, we're, why do we respect the river? Why, you know, story of, you know, a chief long ago and what he did, you know, and this brave warrior did this, you know, and, but it's part of our DNA for me, I, I, you know, I say it's part of my DNA and, and you know, it always has been, I've always, you know, one of the main things I started my book at was always be at parties and everything. Even teenager, I was like, man, you're, you're crazy. You should write a book someday. I would always hear that. <laughs> like, Maybe I will, you know. And then it wasn't until, you know, years later and everything, my friends died and I picked up a pen and um, I was at a place where there was a lot of positive energy. I don't know if I could have did this. If I was still in a place with negative energy because at the end of my first book, you'll see I dedicate to, you know, poor Indian kids who live in a place who dream where dreams are really are rarely dreamt. That's where I come from. Mm -hmm. Never to me be saying to me being a little kid, teenager, seeing seeing I would be in Hollywood, you know, partying around with stars and being on film sets and television sets, you know. Uh I would never dream that ever come true or having a book out. What 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 do I have to say? And but uh, it just comes to me now, you know, and it, it became a part of me to where I took a hiatus, you know, that's what I'm, you know, right now I'm just, I'm, I'm coming back from a hiatus. I took a hiatus, to raised my children, um, cause it was interfering with my being a father and I had demons tackle as well. And, uh, you know, then now I'm coming back and I'm like, all right, a lot of time has passed since I've written. So, but, um, or done some films and, but, uh, I can learn it again and I am learning it again. I actually that's where this Dr. Warbonner project is because I'm learning like uh, the, the horror story I just wrote. I used the camera I never used before, a digital one um, that saves on the hard drive that I've never used with different lenses that I've never used. And um, so I'm learning, you know, because I'm used to working with big cameras, you know, and to work with a small one and big lenses was a whole different experience for me because I'm a really good, I think of myself as a really good camera operator as well. but just driving force of telling the story, knowing that, you know, my time to tell it is good, you know, and um, my important goal, though, is to tell good stories, to have goodness in them, to stay away from all these raunchy plots that, you know, America is driving into our youth and then the people that we got to have. We got to watch something that's very controversial, you know, something like, especially with documentaries, you know, our documentaries are going crazy in a bad way, but um, even the, the humor just not not as good, not as good quality. And I think that's probably where natives suffer too in getting in their foot in the door because we don't bow down to those non-morals. You know, we have morals in our storytelling. And um, that's one of the things I really try to keep. I always want to keep in my mind that I want to inspire with this story. I'm not trying to reach a million, million audience. I'm not trying to sell, you know, whatever ad wants to be sold onto it, attached to that story, you know. Right. I'm trying to sell Coca-Cola or anything like that. I'm trying to just tell a really good story, you know? And then, you know, if it's good enough and great enough, people attach themselves that are right for it to, to the right people that want to watch it, you know? And, and if they don't, you know, I, I write so much that I have so much that um, I'm an untapped resource. You know, I got like a television show I was shopping around for a little bit. I wrote the whole first season. Last powwow, I'm writing the first season of it right now, along with my third book. I'm re just rewriting my third book. And then writing my fourth book, which is going to be the sequel to The Last Powwow or The Brother of Last Powwow. Wow. So I, I jump projects like crazy, like I'm doing them different ones every night. And it, and it kind of helps me. It helps me learn. And then I'm watching like TV like crazy, too. So I'm like. I'm just surrounded by stories almost constantly, you know, even when I'm and then when I hike my hike is my time away from stories. I listen to sermons and stuff like that and spiritual stuff and pray and. And I keep it all balanced, you know, because I want to keep it 
I don't, you know, you know, I, I walked away the first time around because I knew it wasn't right. And I'm glad I did because I couldn't, I would not be happy right now, like I am now, because I'm like the richest person in the world right now because I have my family, they're healthy, I'm healthy. And that's the kind of mindset I need to go in when I write these stories and stuff like that. Not the mindset I had then where I needed to go be at parties and women. And at the time I was even, I was open to drugs back then. And um, I would hate to see what I would have become if I didn't leave Hollywood. And I think at that time when I got that crossroads, it was either Hollywood or my family. Even I knew how self-destructive I would have been. Mm. I would have been one of these bad people. I I might have made it, you know, and um, telling bad stories and just putting bad stuff in there that, you know, really wasn't my intention to begin with, you know, because my intention has always been to inspire children, the youth, basically, the next generation. Yeah. It's always going to be my goal. And, we get into chasing money or to just pleasing people, you know, it's it can really cloud your mind. But when you're at peace at it, like I am now, I'm like really excited for myself because I'm like, all right, now I'm coming back to it mature. I'm really, you know, if I don't make it, then I don't make it. But either way, it's not going to stop me from writing. You know, someone's going to read this story. You know, I got movies that I'll never see the movie, Night of Day, feature films that I've written that I just learned from. So that was my, that was my class into that type of storytelling. I wanted to see if I could tell that type of story, a romantic story, you know, and, um, I, you know, a rom-com. I, I wrote a rom-com one time just to see if I could do it. Spent a whole probably like three months doing it. And I know I'll never see it like a day. Mm. I'm just happy that, all right, when I go into my next story, if I need to use a little cheesy romantic part, I, I know I can have the ability to do it. And I take these little talents, talents from each project. What do you like to, you're watching a lot of stuff. So what kind of shows do you like to watch or, or what kind of story, what storytellers do you like to listen to? Huh. See right now I'm watching uh, raised by wolves. I'm about to start watching um, love, Lovecraft country. I watched the pilot. I'm also watching, I just got to watching QAnon, which I don't know. If you oh, said. Yeah. Yep. I'm watching them kind of documentaries, the cult ones. Mm -hmm. Seems to be a lot of cults here in Oregon. <laughs> oh yeah, that, there's there's a lot of those there. There's another good um, uh, docu series, a four part docu series that just came out. Raul, I'm forgetting his last name. Um, it's called um, Exterminate All the Brutes. Yeah, we just me and my wife were about to watch that today. Started today. But we're uh, almost done with the QAnon one. So I was like, let's do the QAnon one. Let's just go ahead and just start to be closer to the finish. But yeah. I like all the shows like Dexter, um, yeah. Boardwalk <laughs> Empire, Game of Thrones, um, Spartacus. I'm watching uh, American Gods too right now. Holy cow. Uh, just finished Cobra Kai. Cobra Kai was really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so psyched for that one because I'm a big Karate Kid fan and how mm -hmm. how they did it was really cool and how they continue to do it and bring it, you know, used to bet old footage is really yeah, really it's really exciting. And then you have something like um was it um WandaVision? That's that just blew my mind. Like like wow, that's 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 where storytelling is going. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just such good storytelling, such good writing. It blew my mind. Got me excited because I was like, you know, because I, because, you know, they're, they're all formulas. You know, all these are formulas. Right, and right. When you watch a TV show like me, I can. Yeah, it's like a song, right? And, 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 uh, I think what the, the most difficult thing must be is writing comedy, though, because it, it's so dependent on timing and tone and so many things, and you're a little bit off and it just doesn't work, you know? So, um, what what do you find is the most difficult thing to write? Is it comedy? Comedy comes easy for me. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's doing so great out there in the, in the world right now. The comedy written is, isn't as good. Um, I would like to, you know, it always bounces back and forth from what's called multi-camera sitcoms, which mm -hmm. is like the stage, like Seinfeld, you know, we had an audience laughing and then multi-camera Comedies were just like uh, what we're seeing right now. I'm hoping it goes back toward a sitcom world. That's why I really liked about WandaVision was they started out that way, but but kind of portraying it in a different way. Yeah. It wasn't really a sitcom 
single camera comedy. It was a uh, or multi camera. I mean, um, multi camera, single cameras. The ones they're doing now. But um, I just say go back that way because it helps. It helps the comedy. It helps the stories. And um, right now everyone's just fighting for um, just their place for their for a job, basically. Especially right now, so much, so much platforms and channels and everything so yeah. much tv shows it's almost it's almost crazy it's, it's it's a journey just to find a good comedy show that let you want to sit down and watch there's so many to choose from you know and it's a gamble it's like to me it's like going into a city and trying to find a good mexican restaurant you know? <laughs> <laughs> could be a lot of disappointments you know and then but then you'll find a great grand one but it's a hard our struggle back in the day, we didn't have that because you know all the type right, all the top writers were on the top shows, and we were getting fed top notch, you know, jokes. And um, some of them ain't so really so good right now. You know, it's like some some comedy shows I watch. It's like, how is this even a comedy show? You know, it's not. There's only like one joke and one or two jokes in the whole thirty minute episode. Hmm. And they're not that great of jokes. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's it's weird. I mean, for me, I just. So here's I w I'm showing your um, uh, YouTube channel um, that you have, and and you've got uh, five videos on there right now. I'm gonna make sure everyone has this in the. Um, but I I watched them all, and and it, it's it's pretty it's pretty varied. If you don't mind, do you do you mind if I show one of uh, your poem on here? Yeah, go ahead. Do you mind? Let me see. I'm gonna have to. Stop sharing that, and um, let me pull this up real quick. Um, hopefully, there won't be any commercial pop-up, but let's see. Whoops, I, I picked the wrong one. I was going to show us the ways, which we could watch if we wanted to. Um America. Here. Yeah, I usually make stuff and I'll never, I usually don't watch it again. So to watch that opening earlier, I was like, I ain't even seen that since I made it. It's making <laughs> me laugh. <laughs> I was like, it's funny. It's funny stuff. Here we go. I'm going to. Hello, everyone. Coming to you from here in Southern Oregon, a dead end in road. I'm still here. I just want to share some. Spoken word with you. This one I've titled America, the Narcissist by me, that native Thomas. Yesterday you said tomorrow, but yet today we're still here. America, the Narcissist, the United States affair. You've beat us and kissed our bruises and pretend it'll all be okay with tear gas, rubber bullets, and nooses. You've kept us in silence with no say, but we have a voice, a narcissist's nightmare. Your names no longer shame us because we've united a narcissist's fear. Protectors and servers serving prejudice and murders for our narcissist government ran by narcissist president feeding narcissist lies to the make America great residents. It's supposed to be land of the free it's supposed to be land of the blessed. Instead, it's land of white privilege. Instead, it's land of the oppressed. We march for justice. We march as one. They march using force. They march using guns. And on the streets of America, a racial war has begun. But united, the people speak. Something has to be done. Now we have the ultimate weapon. Now the revolution is recorded by our phones. Now we control the news as it happens. Now our nation in turmoil has been exposed. Yesterday you said tomorrow, but today you dangle from a rope. America, the hanging narcissist. Now, the United States of hope. Aho. hope. Uh -huh. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> who's that, who's that chubby angry Indian? 
<laughs> hey man, let it all hang out. <laughs> if you've got a voice like that, it don't matter. <laughs> yeah, that's at a place called Did In the Road here near where I live, you know. Yeah. My wife's really trying to help organize and be part of this organization that's trying to get it changed. And um we plan to still do some stuff with it. Um but yeah, this is it shouldn't be they really they really defending that road too. They don't want to change the name of it. And no one really knows the story behind it, though. I mean, it's really interesting. We're, we're trying to find more factual information. It's not a oral, what people heard, why it's called that. But, uh, yeah, it still sits there, did Indian Road. And um, yeah, I was that seems like it. an easy one to change. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> My wife has been part of it, you know, where they, she's even presented it to the, the county council and everything like that. And mm -hmm. I first met her, that's what she was doing, you know, it's, one of the things I was like, hey, this girl's got a fire. She's got uh, some passion in her. And she still does. She's still fighting for a lot of rights for Americans with her organization. The organization she works for, which is Lima Natives and uh, Native American. Maybe it was a Native. I can't remember. I can't remember the other one, but a bad memory. Well, that's not good. You got to remember your wife's stuff, man. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, um, but yeah, you know, poetry is one of the things I've done too. I was actually, uh, I used to do poetry slams around Lawrence, Kansas against poets in Kansas City and different areas, and I used to win. Hmm. Yeah, I used to be one of the main ones around there. I used to do it. I got some of those videos, which you showed my YouTube channel, but there's actually another one with a lot of my older stuff, including some of the older poetry things. And um, But I call that one the old Thomas YouTube channel. It's the one you show is new Thomas. I got it. The other one's really showing you where I, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. I, I'll be able to show where I came from and where, mm -hmm. where I went. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of it's uh, like my music videos are my old one. I have really, that, you know, really crazy music videos on there and that I shot. And I, you know, I said produced for a hip hop group. So, you know, I, done it all you know so I, I i score a lot of my short films you know so a lot of things i do i score so i can write them score them shoot them edit them act in them and do it all which wow. is what uh that with the way is my war film watch that one it's all done by me written um acted voiceovers the music i did the scary music in it you know and i did did it all basically edit it and and that's another thing, you know, just learning. Just, I just like, I just got to learn how to, because when I was making my first short film, Haiti goes, hey, I didn't like the idea that I couldn't get in film festivals unless I had rights to the music. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to make my own music. And um, I asked, asked a friend of mine if I could borrow his um, keyboard and made the music for it. And I had my brother who was doing raps and my friend who could rap and got them on a microphone on a karaoke machine and wrote and recorded a song live, a rap song live, and a couple of them. And put them in that short film. Hey, should we watch? Should we watch the ways? What do you think? Yeah, Let me. I hope I just lost it. Hold on. Um. So what? So you just wanted to figure out how to write a a horror movie and to see if well, you can do it. Several, I've written several horror movies that. I still have that I'm going to shop around later. Yeah. I want to see if I could shoot one. But I came up with a new one, a new story. Oh, I lost it. Hold on. The ways. Here it is. All right. And plus being pandemic, I didn't have, I couldn't go around people or anything like that. So I had to really come up with something I could just shoot by myself. And um, use my son. My son was in it as well. And just, you know, s see if I could do it. Use that new camera that I never used. And <laughs> which is really the biggest obstacle of it was using that camera because I was not used to uh, those type of lenses and things like that. And um, it took, took a lot of reshooting. But luckily I had the time. And my, as soon as my family went to sleep, you know, I break out the camera and shoot it all around here by myself at, late at night. Wow. Wow. All right. Well, well, 
Let's watch it. It's called The Ways by that native Thomas, Thomas Yepa. Here we go. I'm going to take us down. There was once a man, a Native American man. His tribe had many traditions and beliefs. Some they practiced and followed to ward off evil and protect them from it. There were ceremonies, medicine, and things they just didn't do. They called them their ways. This man's father was strict and following one of their ways that kept evil from entering into their home. Never, ever, as a kid, was he allowed to leave any of his favorite toys outside overnight. There was a belief that an evil spirit, a demon, could attach itself to a favorite toy because it was loved so much, and demons were attracted to that. This man, when he was a boy, lost many of his favorite toys because of this belief. His dad would burn them all in fires because it was the only way to destroy the demons that might have infested those toys. And then this man had a son who left one of his favorite toys outside overnight. It all started one morning when the man was awakened by three rings from his doorbell. There was no one at his door though, but then he saw it. One of his son's favorite toys on the ground. He remembered his people's ways. He knew what he had to do. He had to get rid of it, burn in the fire. But it was one of his son's favorite toys. He would crush his son if it went missing. He couldn't bring himself to do it. So instead of following his ways, the man brought this toy back inside his home. He didn't see any harm in it. No one else knew it had been outside all night long, except him. Plus, it was way too early in the morning to deal with his people's ways. All was good until one night, the tulipo flushed by itself. His son was away that night, and his wife was asleep, so there was no one there that could have flushed it. Later, the tulip bulb flushed by itself again. Third time being a charm, the tulip bowl flushed itself one last time. What are you doing here? 
can't believe he left you. And not harmonica. After that, strange things began to happen in the man's home. He would shut the blinds at night to find three of them open in the morning. He would also find three ceiling fans in his home turned on full blast every morning. Then it got a little more serious when he awoke and started finding all of his outside doors wide open. Something was not right and it got worse. One night the man began to hear knocks. Finally, the realization that the knocks came in three reminded him of different ways he followed. He was a man of God, too, and had heard stories of this mock knock in church. It was something demons did when they infested a home. Demons knocked in threes to mock the Trinity, God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, one for each of them. It also dawned on him that everything had been happening in threes. Now, there were three knocks. It was a sign a demon was now in his home. The next day, he told his wife about the toy being left outside overnight and how he didn't follow his tribe's ways to protect them from evil. He also told her about his godly ways and that all of it was a sign that there was a demon in their home now. It didn't take any more than that for his wife to decide to take their son and stay at her family's while he did what he had to do to get rid of that demon. The man didn't care much for his people's ceremonies, but he knew enough about them to perform one. It was best to make sure the demon stayed inside the toy so that he could send it back to where it came from properly. So he prepared and gathered his weapon and medicine together. It would take both his godly ways and the ways of his people to rebuke the evil that he had brought into his home. When he started to smudge it, that's when he heard it. 
for the first time. It was one of the worst sounds he had ever heard. He smudged and smudged. And smudged and smudged. And then he trapped it. The man made a fire in his backyard to burn the toy in. But a strong wind freed it before he could destroy it. The man started to look for it. But then he heard a familiar sound come from inside his home. It was the sound of his son playing with the toy. The man was happy his son was home so fast. But after hearing the harmonica twice, he stopped walking toward his home. He waited to hear it a third time to see if it was the demon playing tricks on him. A third time never came though. Not until he entered his home. <laughs> They found the man dead with that harmonica stuck in his throat. The toy finally killed him. So a toy was my harmonica? Yes, it was your harmonica. So the man was my dad? Yes, it was. Your harmonica, it was evil, and it killed your dad. But now, I'm here to protect you forever. Oh, okay. Hold on. I gotta burn some sage after that. <laughs> Take your mute off there, Thomas. Woo! <laughs> it scared my son, and he was in it. <laughs> oh, God, I bet it did. Holy! <laughs> First time we watched it, he was all scared. <laughs> oh, Dad, you made me do that. <laughs> That was great, man. Uh, you're, you're, I don't know anything about film, so I don't know how to, how to critique it. Um, but, uh, that was really good. The music was really good. The angles were great. The shaking of the, um, you were going in the house and the camera was back here shaking and, and, and moving and, and, uh, it was really, really good, Thomas. And yeah. you did that just recently, this, yeah, this just, last year? I was trying to get it done for um, Halloween, but I don't think yeah. I finished it until like the December. Yeah. I had to do a lot of reshoots because I was learning that camera. And re I didn't realize certain things about it. And like I said, the lenses I wasn't used to and get to the lighting. Um, I'm really big on lighting too. So I, I, to me, everything has to be perfectly lit and that, that took a lot of different different things. I was working on a new lighting kit I have. 
So I had to really learn that. So basically, it was just it was a learning learning tool that when I start shooting films again, that um, I'll know how, I'll know how to do it better now. That's Man, what how so? How long did it take you to to do that? I started probably in the first second week of October, and I finished the first week of December, I think. So that almost two months. Yeah. Wow. And I was just uh, a lot of it was reshooting, and um, the editing was tricky too. Um, I had to learn a, a different system of editing that I have, and so basically, I just uh, just new stuff, new equipment, new system, and learning. It. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, being a perfectionist like I am for my acting, being hard on myself for my acting, and even though there wasn't a lot of dialogue, I think I only said one or two things in it. But to try to act and then act late at night when my family's are my family's asleep, you know, and I'm tired. I don't want to do it. And <laughs> you can tell my eyes are all, some, <laughs> all tired. So I would have to really learn how to give that was appropriate for the character <laughs> though. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That, that was cool. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that ending. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. you. Glad, glad you we were did. able to share that. And, and, uh, um, as, as we get to, to wrap up the show tonight, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go right to bed after this. <laughs> I, I used to have a, 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 a temper to be able to handle scary movies, but I, I don't anymore. Um, I don't know if that has to do with getting older or what. Is there something about horror movies that you like, or you just like scaring people? You like, you like making people emote somehow, don't you? You like to make them laugh or cry or something. I think so. And, you know, in the, in the business, they call the genres. You know, what are you, a genre writer? Which means you're comedy or horror. Yeah. They're like, they're like side by side to each other. They're almost the same. Mm -hmm. type of the reaction and emotion. You know, one's laughing, one's being scared, you know. And um, the good thing about genre pieces, you don't need stars to do them. You know, you watch some of the big, um, big horror movies that, that make it a lot of you know old days stars weren't part of them they they became stars after them but not during the making of them same with comedies you can write something like super bad before all those guys were famous you know and now they're all famous but at the beginning no one knew who they were mm -hmm. and you know that's what I like to, but I like I like to make people laugh and feel emotions and I I grew up with scary movies watch them as a young kid my kids did my, my son does right now too and I just love it, you know. So like when I, I got Shutter, you know, I see all these old movies and like they're, they're, they're really one I haven't seen. It's like as now you look at them too, I was like, why did I look at what when it, what date it came out? You know, I was like, what was I doing watching that at seven years old? You know, <laughs> and <laughs> this, where did I even get access to watch this movie? I know I saw it when it came out. You know, right, right. I know I saw this movie in a movie theater. What was I doing in a movie theater watching this show? You know, and how did I get there? But I know my grandma was really helpful in, in my watching movies growing up at a young age and, and introduced me to movies and it played a big part of me and her, our relationship. And um, my mother as well, she's a big movie buff. She likes a lot of movies, different kinds, never really, you know, filtered it for me. He's like, that allowed me to watch what I want. You know, I remember watching Pl Pl Platoon at a young age and being really inspired by that, you know, that war movie and Apocalypse Now as well. And, and then me knowing the relationship between the two but the ball there that played in Publix Now and Charlie Sheen and Platoon and the writing styles and the shooting styles. And, you know, at a young age, I knew I was introduced to stuff like that. Then Full Metal Jacket, which Stanley Kubrick's one of my favorite directors, you know, so I knew all this. And Oliver Stone's one of my favorite storytellers and <clears throat> Francis Ford Coppola as well. And, um, yeah, and I knew all, you know, knew about, could break them all down at a young age and then with horror movies as well. With Nightmare on Elm Street, the Texas Chainsaw Massacres, I've seen them all. And mm -hmm. Even the ones I haven't seen, like you know, Spit on Your Grave, really bad ones, and uh, Last House on the Left, and you know things that just mess with your mind rather than monsters. Yeah. And then it comes to you know stuff like Sixth Sense, and one of the things I started doing this film, which I was telling a friend of mine just recently, it's a lot of it's just about sound. Yeah. Just a lot of the, and the silence. I said, and, you know, like I was telling my son as we were shooting this, you know, it's like, 
one of the worst things I think you can do in the horror movie is show the monster, you know, let the person create the monster in their head and what it's going to look like. Like, you know, me getting killed at the end inside this back room I'm in right now. I don't show what's in there waiting on me, what it looked like, blah, blah, or anything like that. Just let that little, mm-hmm. just add some roars and let the imagination take care of that. Yeah. So you alluded to a, a few things, but what are your future projects? What are you doing next? Next, uh, let's see, with Dr. Bourbon, I'll tell you, I'm going to do another, create a couple more characters just, just, for fun and uh, maybe try to tie them together. I actually have a couple of TV um, comedy skit television pilots I've written and um, much my, my, my kind of um, blend them together with these characters I created because so those, those pilots are already written. All these skits are already written. I got so much skits written mm-hmm. and uh, but never thought about, you know, having it to where it revolves around three characters maybe and um, something like an Ali G show type thing maybe with mm-hmm. the native, you know. Yeah. And just doing all these different characters. It's it's an idea that just still brewing in my head. But my first, my next project is um doing my final draft of my Native Love X Internet Chronicle book, my third book. Right. It's done, but I just want to add this extra chapter in there. And um I think we'll make it better. And then kind of rewrite another chapter to, to make the direction go a little bit differently. Like I was telling, like I was saying, um it's a real romance novel, real Native American romance novel. Uh, not like, like I was telling you, not like, not like a Harlequin romance. And it really, I'm really going to be proud of this one. That's why it took him so long to do it. I actually wrote this book before The Last Powwow. But because Stephen Paul Judd was so excited about The Last Powwow, he, um, I said, well, I just wrote this book. You know, I'm going to try to get that published because I got a contract with my publishing company for my next book. And he said, let's do this. And I was like, all right, look. I'll go back because I'm not satisfied with the first draft. Hmm. Like my first book had 24 drafts and I was like in the third draft of the this next one. I'm just the romance novel I'm doing. And then I did uh, the last powwow and it got me really excited. So I was like, oh, yeah, this is a really good book, you know. And so I ended up doing like, I think with like 12 drafts of that, half the drafts I usually do. And um, that's when it got to be published that. But I was like, I'm going to go back to my romance novel one of these days or do that one. And uh, now I'm back at it. And I, and I kind of got the story where I wanted to go. And I tell you, I think I'm taking a different direction because it's not your normal romance book like Harlequin, but it's going to be a real native romance, which is mean there's going to be, like I tell you, cheating involved. There's going to be um, trauma, you know, that some women go through and men. Yeah. That, you know, that we you mean it's not going to be a big, hunky, long haired <laughs> no, Indian not man? A, not going to be a white woman hanging on the leg of him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> saving him, saving her, saving her. It's gonna deal with real stuff, you know. Yeah, like I was saying earlier, uh, narcissist is gonna be uh, a big thing in it. I want to introduce, especially young women, to the word narcissist. You know, I mean, any women mothers out there should be telling their children about narcissists. You know, and I could tell you, I, I was, you know, one myself, and had to have something really bad to overcome. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of trauma in my life. Uh, led me that way or took me that way, but being, you know, getting help and all that was got me out of it. And that's why I'm able to be a, a good person when that can have good relationships, you know, good marriage and everything. You know, before then, I like, you know, I look back at now, man, I had no business being in a relationship anytime before I was 30, before I really started taking things serious, you know. And I wrote this book to my, for my daughter to show her that how love can go bad, you know. And things you gotta watch out for, like you know, a cheater always be a cheater, a beater always be beater. They can change, but if they beat you or cheat on you, it's not gonna be with you that they're gonna change with. And um, stuff, things like that. Like I said, narcissist when guys just really mentally abuse people. It doesn't have to be physically, and you know, to make you feel like this. And how relationships are supposed to be, you know, uplifting. And that's where my new ending is coming from. You know, it's just like this woman finds a new man and everything to where she almost don't trust it. It's so good, you know, and a lot of, you know, and that's where, you know, your self-sabotaging comes in where you'll self-sabotage your relationship because you believe it's, you know, it's not what you're used to, not what you grew up seeing, stuff like that in a real Native American type environment I grew up in. That's not what we're used to seeing. We're not used to seeing people go, you know, march together in the sunset. 
you know, <laughs> right. you know that problems will arise you know and that's the part of being in a relationship is taking those struggles and especially struggles we deal with native but my but my love story takes place along with the story between their lady and this brother buffalo grandma spider grandma, uh, grandpa snake and so there's mythical creatures in her, in her as well that are yeah. actually in relationships yeah. as well intertwining with these people and the stories so those realism and mythicalism together and uh yeah. they talk about the first marriage ever there's about the first first divorce ever which was between grandma spider and grandpa snake then it goes on to the so these characters in my story also deal with these mythical characters as well yeah. and then not only dealing with relationships but they're dealing with curses generational curses but mythical curses on their people and stuff like that. And it's really, it's bouncing between different worlds. And I think it's what's gonna make it really great. So that's my next project is finishing it up. I always, I keep post, I post about it like once or twice a year. Hey, my romance book is coming out soon, but then I come up with some more, you know, and, but then I'm I'm working on other stuff. So I got to push the back burner, but this time I'm like, you know what? I survived 2020, I better get this book out. You know, who knows what's coming next? <laughs> you know, I could have died in 2020. And, this book wouldn't have been to help out whoever's supposed to help out, you know, bring awareness to stuff like that, you know, like like sexual trauma that you know people are afraid to talk about or tell their kids about. Something I was afraid to tell my daughter about. It's in the book, you know. Your dad wasn't perfect, you know, but a lot of it was bad stuff I had to go through. I went through, you know. Yeah, but I, but then in the end, there's love at the end. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Well, good. Just so there's that. there's maybe a happy ending. Maybe there's a lot of it. Well, that's one of the things I had to balance out is happy stories. Like I tell you, narcissists are really good mm -hmm. at the relationship at the beginning at really impressing the woman. At, you know, like me, I, I was really good at impressing, you know, doing the greatest things you could do for love and stuff like that. And um, so I tell those stories, you know, how I can evolve from that. So there's good stories and bad stories, but in the end, yeah, love, mm -hmm. love, love rules, love conquers all, you know. Yes. And, you know, but but sometimes you don't have to go through all that. It's like simple things of telling my my daughter with my 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 parents as well. You know, it's like uh, they were better off with not with each other than they were with each other. They were they were toxic with each other enough to where it passed down to us, you know. And they don't did more damage to us staying together than they did helping us. Mm -hmm. And the same way with my children and my ex was we were good at one point, but at a certain certain around the way we were just toxic. And we're now we're apart. We're both better, even better parents being apart mm -hmm. than we were when we we're together and taking our children through what we we're taking them through. So it has a lot to do with that too. Yeah. Well, we need you to get back to writing and get that story done because I want to read this, and uh, I, I want to see you do more and and uh, uh, get out all this work that that you're working on. Um, uh, I, I really like your stuff, Thomas. I hope everyone will uh, go watch some Dr. Warbonnet or go to uh, uh, Thomas's various websites. Google the man. <laughs> Find yeah, because it. even if I don't get on TV again, because TV is another, like I said, I have TV shows written full seasons. Yeah. Even if I don't get picked up in Hollywood or anything like that again, you know, if that bus sorry passed me. I've, you know, I've been there. I've done it. I got YouTube. I can do it on my own. My mm. own money. And, you know, things I write don't cost money to shoot. And, uh, you know, I got enough, I know enough talented people to make them work. And so I was like, nothing ain't stopping me. I ain't making, you know, and there's no excuses for me not to be telling my stories now. Yeah. Now that I'm back from my hiatus, you know, I took a hiatus to be a father. And like I said, get rid of some of my demons. And uh, I'm back and I'm ready to really get my stories out there whatever way I can. You know, when this Dr. Warbonch is kind of helping me my new creative process and my experimenting i'm experimenting with it until where i get to something more solid but um got my third book i just told you about coming and um and a feature couple of feature films i'm interested in probably throwing at some people to see if they're they want to make them because some of them i know i'm not i'm never going to make because i don't want to invest the time in it but they're really good story i think someone should tell them yeah yeah not, not me somebody that's awesome. That's awesome, Thomas. Well, we wish you the best of luck. And I really appreciated your time tonight. Um, I, I'm so enlightened. And now I have a whole uh, new few things to watch out there. So um, good luck on uh, 
your continuing uh, creative process, and we hope you we see more of you soon. Yes, good time to be native. Yes, <laughs> for, sure. for sure. Hey, thanks Thank you for your time. Thanks, Thomas. I'm gonna take you down. I'll close out, and uh, we'll see you here soon. Um, let's see. So thanks everyone tonight. I Hello everyone in the chat. I hope you had a good time watching the show tonight. Uh, not sure what's coming next week. As you know, uh, we've been changing uh, times and days for the show and we're just playing around with things on this end. Um, but thanks for coming and joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing y'all next week. Please uh, I would really love it. And so would the Association on American Indian Affairs. If you would go to our YouTube page and like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks so much. And we'll see you back here again on Red Hoop Talk.